It's a privilege, thank you for being here. Um, and it's great to, to have this talk on, on Dunwall and, and Nambri land uh, and talk about what exactly is happening in space. Because there are so many things happening at an accelerated rate, I think it's exciting to talk about. Uh, and as you'll see, so many things have happened in a few weeks, months, years. And, and when we think about where is it headed? What are we doing? Why? All these sorts of things. I think it's an exciting time because we actually don't know why. And we don't know where. And we don't know actually what we're doing. But that's the fun bit. And, and, I, and I think we sometimes focus so much on what is the end? What are we trying to achieve? And those are important things, but that also constrains you into working to getting to that point. When really, the most exciting point may be on that. And so this is the fun part of where we are in space. And it's also not just thinking about what are we going forwards. It's also about going backwards. You know, we're lucky to live in a country where astronomy has been practiced for thousands and thousands of years. And we're just now starting to understand knowledge that has been held by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders for millennia. And we are now just catching up to what they've been able to do. And in fact, this is always one of my favorite examples, where to Yuang. Uh, and this is in Geelong, uh, or near Geelong, um, near the Avalon Airport. And essentially, this is Australia's Stonehenge. Now, this rock formation here, the rocks aren't as tall as Stonehenge, but when astronomers and indigenous knowledge, knowledge holders mapped them, you're able to trace that it tracks sunset in the middle of winter, in the middle of summer, and along the equinox. So Stonehenge works one time a year. This works four times a year. Stonehenge is 6,000 years old. This is 11,000 years old. So to be able to fact that you're able to measure this accurately over this span has been quite remarkable. And as I said, we're really just now starting to comprehend uh, all of this stuff and then use this for our own research and direction. And so, and I think this is the exciting bit is where we're headed is, is with lots of people. And we think about what are the skills who are gonna be doing and working in astronomy and space over the next decade or two. It is not just people like me, and I think that's the exciting bit. It is in a range of fields and knowledge that is needed to accomplish whatever it is we may accomplish. I, I like showing this photo for a variety of reasons. But when we think about the Earth, we think of this beautiful blue globe, but we also have to think about what our impacts are. Now, satellites have a lot of benefits. Satellites also come with a lot of baggage. And as we start sending more and more satellites up, yesterday alone, for yesterday set a record. Yesterday alone, there was four rockets that went into space carrying over three dozen satellites, plus 17 other rockets that went up into the atmosphere and came back down. There was 21 rocket launches alone yesterday. What and where we're doing in space is dramatically changing. Accessing space is also being what we say democratized. And that is simply, it is no longer in the hands of a few rich countries. It is no longer in the hands of just a few big organizations. And things like this, something that Australia is leading, Canberra is leading, believe it or not, that is a stamped UNSW built between A and U and UNSW Canberra, are satellites the size of loaves of bread. This is the entire satellite. And these are built for groups like Optus, Defense, Air Force. And what can, you can do with them can now dramatically change the game. When we, when we think back to a few summers ago and the massive, terrible bushfires we had, well, images like this actually provided crucial information. But they also provided crucial opportunities to figure out, what can we do better? And now there's a project being embarked on uh, led by ANU and Optus to within a few years be able to detect a bushfire anywhere in Australia within five minutes. So if you think about it, 
Most of the fires are lightning strikes in remote locations. If you can pinpoint it within five minutes, you can put resource on it within five minutes, not five days. And the impacts of this are dramatic. And this is all being driven by a world now of accessible cheap technology. We have companies like Skycraft also in Canberra building, this is a bigger version of a satellite, believe it or not, building a network of satellites to accurately and continuously monitor airplanes. When we think back a few years ago and the, the tragedy of MH370, a lot of people say, how can you lose an airplane? Well, satellites are basic photography. You have to know where you're looking and take an image. But they have an even worse problem, and that is they go around the Earth every 90 minutes. So you can't see every point of the Earth all the time. So the idea is if you build up an accurate network and a ring of satellites as they all move, follow the leader around the Earth, you can see every point in space continuously on Earth. Meaning things like MH370 will no longer happen. And this is all because the technology is allowing us to build them in a very cheap and affordable way. But with it comes baggage. Like a very interesting adventure I had last week. And space junk is becoming a really big problem. Yes, this didn't hurt any of Mick or Jock's sheep uh, in uh, the Snowies. But of the five major events where space junk has hit the Earth, Two are in Australia. Three have happened in the past two years. And so as we send more and more things into space, this becomes more and more of reality. And so this means our solutions and our challenges and what we're doing in space is requiring a drastically different skill set. It's also changing and requiring a lot of interesting opportunities and technology. So we're at, we're at school, so we have a quiz. We'll see how many fail. All right. So I have six options up here. Which one hasn't happened in the past few years or so or will happen this year? So let's, we'll give ourselves like a four-year time window to the end of this year or three years ago. Which one of these will or, or hasn't happened? Is it a 4G network on the moon? Lasers? Zapping space junk, digging on an asteroid, a drone on Mars, a Hollywood movie filmed in space, or the first prize in a raffle is a trip into space. Now, that wasn't an option here, by the way. Sorry. So what is it? Five, one. <laughs> hey, look, the MBA is not my problem. I am a Vodafone customer, so I understand the problem, though. Um, oh, come on, it's true. Um, no. They're all true. And this is the point. And this is the point. A, it's a good trick question. But B, we can't even figure out what is real or not. And yes, for instance, number two is happened at Mount Stromlo Observatory. Between EOS and ANU, uh, we have a system on the right there that uses a laser to deorbit space junk. It's the first of its kind. And we don't, we're not deorbiting giant satellites, we're orbiting things on the left. So on the left here uh, is an image of, of the space shuttle Atlantis. So the space shuttle used to have bulletproof glass. And this hole, which is about five centimeters thick in, in bulletproof glass, was caused by a flake of paint. So we saw that big piece that landed to the Earth. What we worry about in space is all these little bits, flakes of paint, screwdrivers, hammers, that astronauts drop, which are currently orbiting the Earth. You're traveling 25,000 kilometers an hour. Now imagine being hit by a hammer traveling 25,000 kilometers an hour. I, I don't think you have to figure out hard what's gonna happen there. And so this laser can look and deorbit small junk and bring it back to the Earth and have it burn up safely. And again, it is the first of its kind to start solving some of the issues of junk in space. And for number one, in November, 
NASA and Nokia will deploy the first 4G network on the moon. And this is all part of the effort to go back to the moon. So now why do you need a 4G network on the moon? Well, astronauts will be on the surface. They'll be in orbit. They'll be going around. They need to talk to each other. They need to send videos, data, TikTok, or whatever it is. Um, uh, they need to be able to communicate in a very effective way. And so the mesh network is the best way of doing this and upgrading it. And this is all part of this effort to get back to the moon. And Artemis is the name of that plan, led by the US, and Australia is a massive partner in this, to go back to the moon. But not just go there, stay there and move on. And Artemis 1 will go around the moon for a trip for about 30 days and come back using the space launch system. And this is scheduled for 29 August. So when we ask, when are we going back to the moon? When are we gonna start sending the equipment for humans? Later this month. This is a, a changing world of also who's going into space. So just to put this into scale, all the way up until 2019, only two countries have ever landed on the moon, the US and Russia. In 2019 alone, three countries attempted landings, China, Israel and India. This year, seven countries are participating in missions to the moon that never have. South Korea launched their first mission to the moon on Friday. New Zealand launched a mission with NASA to the moon last month. Who and what is happening in space is changing. China has landed on the far side of the moon with the Chong 4 and the Chong 5 rover, which happened in uh, December 2020. And this was the third mission to land on the moon, extract resources, and return to Mongolia in December 2020. Australia is now building a rover that will go to the moon to extract oxygen from the soil, landing on the surface in probably 2025, 2026, as part of Artemis IV. And so it's a dramatic change in what we're doing on the moon. So why? why? Why all of a sudden do we have this moon finish? We have to ask ourselves, why did we stop going to the moon? Does anyone know why? There's two main reasons. One, we didn't know what else to do. The whole race was to get to the moon. And then we got there. OK. We got there. Great. Why? What else do you do? No one knew. And this was fueled by the second reason, the cost of the program. The Apollo program in today dollars costs 170 billion US. At the peak of it, the Apollo program was 8% of the entire US budget. That project alone. It was a massive amount of money being spit to go into space. That is no longer the case. And I like to bring up this, Chandrayaan-2, uh, India's first mission to land on the moon. They built an orbiter, the lander, and the rover. This cost $92 million. Now, still a lot of money, but let's put this into scale. About 10 years ago, there was a movie, Gravity, with Sandra Bullock and George Clooney, where George Clooney turns into space junk and we all cheer. Um, but that movie cost $120 million to make. It is literally now cheaper to go into space than make the movie about going into space. Avengers Endgame cost $242 million. You could build almost three missions to the moon. Australia, a group in South Australia is building a satellite to go and monitor and find all of the ice on the moon for a cost of $10 million to be launched in a year. Because the race now is that there's stuff we can use. There is ice everywhere on the moon. And if you have ice, you have water. If you have water, you have H2O. If you have H2O, you have hydrogen and oxygen. You now have rocket fuel. This is the race. The race isn't to say, let's just go to the moon and hang around. Let's go to the moon, set up, so we can go to other places in space. And so then we start thinking about how are we going to do this? How are we going to start digging things out of the moon? And what are the issues? What are the problems with this? Australia is in the middle of it. 
And the Hayabusa 2 mission was the first to really do this. This was the Japanese Space Agency mission, uh, which Australia participated in. And what we did twice was this probe went down to the surface. And then what you'll see is essentially it's going to vacuum up as much rock as it possibly can. In fact, on the second attempt, we had five kilograms of C4 and we blew a hole in the asteroid. And then we sucked all that rock up. We're about to touch down. It then left the surface, made a return journey back, and came to Earth. So here's touchdown. There's all the rock coming out, which then got sucked up. This then landed in South Australia, December 2020, here. Now, there's, there's two things I'd like to point about this. One, if you notice, it, it's a parachute. This, the probe didn't land. What the probe did, leave the asteroid, come to Earth, parachute the samples down, and then make a turn to go to the next asteroid. We've been able to build a probe to go to an asteroid, land twice, come back to Earth, drop those samples off, and go to the next one. But there's another part of this. This landed in Woomera in South Australia. And it poses a very interesting thing. Why did it land in Woomera? Well, the answer is, it was South Australia. That's the answer. Woomera is a protected zone. And in 2019, or 2018, there was a massive study done that says, if we're going to start going to places in the solar system and bringing things there and back, we should worry about where and what we're bringing. What if on the off chance, very small chance, you bring a contaminant like a bacteria or a virus? So everyone said, look, you're going to bring some uncontrolled virus back and it's going to doom Earth. That seems a bit far-fetched. And then 2020 rolled around and everyone took it seriously all of a sudden. And so Woomera was partially chosen that if something went wrong, you can lock down the entire region. And right now, there's a whole field called space epidemiology. How do we deal with contaminants in space? But also, how do we not contaminate other places? We're traveling around the solar system. That's our goal. How do we make sure that we don't change Mars or change a moon of Jupiter and Saturn? And so this is a whole new field that we're trying to understand because as we explore the risk of contamination, both bringing it here and there, is a huge one. And so this really thinks about then how we're exploring Mars. And we think of Mars, it's very Australian-like, right? The red dirt is from iron oxide. You can see evidence of water on the surface, both in Central Australia and Mars. And so how we're exploring Mars is drastically different. In ingenuity, it's the first drone to fly on Mars, which is amazing. So firstly, this drone, because Mars is so far away, you have to uh, communicate with it and pre-program it. There's a delay between 8 and 25 minutes, meaning you can't control it in real time. So you have to upload the commands. It has to fly without human intervention and come back. And this can do it. The other aspect is rovers on Mars are very slow. The top speed of a NASA rover is 140 meters per hour. So imagine this. Imagine I want to go a kilometer to the left. It's going to take me a day. Then I realize I should have gone right. So now I got to take another day to get back and a day to get there. The drone, as it will come back, can do 100 meters a minute. NASA has just announced that it's going to send drones to Mars to collect samples, hop back in a rocket, and return to Earth. So we can start exploring new places. But also, who is going into space is dramatically changing. Tom Cruise, after NASA sent humans into space with SpaceX, says, I want to go into space. And everyone said, that's a great idea. But his mission got bumped, which is quite funny. So in the meantime, the Russians said, we have actors and actresses. Why don't we send them into space? And so Yulia personally, last year, filmed the first part of a movie on the International Space Station. In fact, for a brief moment, Tom Cruise's movie and her movie were going to overlap in the space station, having two competing movie sets in space. So instead, Tom Cruise has now pioneered building a movie studio 
on the International Space Station by 2024 to film an entire movie in space and probably be left there. Um, so, but the other aspect is it's not just movie stars going into space. It is ordinary people. Now, this mission inspiration four happened and, and Chris on the top there went into space because his friend went into a raffle prize and his friend won the raffle, but he couldn't go. So he gave his ticket to Chris. So Chris on the left, who is completely ordinary and not special in any way, no offense, um, went into space because his friend won a raffle prize. And this poses the really interesting last issue of space. And that is who is going in is changing, which is great. But we are barely understanding how humans affect space. This is William Shatner, who is the oldest person in space now. Does he look comfortable? He's shattening himself. Um, humans are essentially bags of fluid with skin. That's what we are. Take gravity away, where does it go? There are a huge number of health problems astronauts are just starting to understand. A good example and a scary example is DVT, deep, deep vein thrombosis. You get it if you sit on a long haul airplane. Astronauts get it in their neck. 50% of astronauts get blood clots in the neck. They have vision problems, bone problems, cardiovascular problems. You name it, there's a health problem in space. And the problem is, who's looking after these people? Well, believe it or not, the Radford graduates. Not meaning to scare you. Um, there is a big program in Australia right now to make sure space is safe for everyone, not just the astronauts. And so space is dramatically changed, but the opportunities in space have changed. It's not just the world of physicists and engineers. It's ethicists, doctors, lawyers, policymakers, finance. This is how space is evolving. And this is who we need to make space successful. Thanks.